There's an element of the course that occurs several times and tends to give students some difficulty, and that is uh, equivalent payment streams. And this is where um, several payments have been already decided upon, and then there's a change for one reason or another, uh, and uh, we have to decide, well, what does the new payment stream have to look like? Now, this occurs in simple interest. I think that's on currently in the book uh, Exercise 6.5. Uh, and or 6.6, .6, I believe it's 6.5, and it occurs later with compound interest. So we have different formulas. We have the simple interest formula, S is equal to P times 1 plus RT, if money's going ahead in time, and uh, conversely, P is equal to S times 1 plus RT to the minus 1 if it's going back in time. And with compound interest, of course, the same thing, we just have uh, S is P times 1 plus I to the N, and conversely, uh, P is S, 1 plus I to the minus N. So it, it, exactly the same techniques uh, occur in both situations. So that's what we want to look at today, um, fairly briefly, but I'm going to be working through a handout. The hand, handout is called Strategies for Solving Equivalent Payment Streams. Uh, you can ask your instructor if they have availability to this. Um, I'm on the verge of retiring, to, to be honest with you, so I can't guarantee where this thing's going to reside, but it does exist, all right? So uh, if you ask your teacher, hopefully somewhere in eLearn, they can uh, find this. The first occurrence of it should be in Math 101, when it's simple interest, and there should be another occurrence of it uh, in Math uh, 201, if you like, or 10037. Um, but it would be the same handout, still this handout shows the formulas with simple interest, but of course the same concepts exactly hold true for compound interest. So let's, let's get on with it. Uh, one of the things I said uh, in this handout, why would such problems occur in real life? So I, I've given you an example that you owe, you borrowed money from someone, uh, maybe let's say $7,200, something like that, and you've agreed that you're going to pay it back with interest. So calculations have been done, uh, and the agreement has been that you will make a payment to the person that lent you the money of, let's say, $3,000 six months from the date of the original loan, and a further payment of $4,600 12 months from the date of the original loan. So these monies already include interest. So you don't need to worry about that. This is set in stone. This is an agreement that's been written down. Uh, and what we would hope, 90% of the time at least, that uh, you would pay the $3,000 to the uh, lender uh, six months from now from the date of the loan and the other $4,600 12 months from the date of the loan and then we would not have a math question. So all would be good and we could get on with our lives. But as often happens, uh, things occur in life uh, that we have no control over and, and uh, we have to look at what would happen if you had to go in and renegotiate this with the lender. So what I'm going to call this above the line is payment stream one. So I just make a squiggly line there and I call that payment stream one, PS1, just so we can refer to formulas later. Uh, and we look at, and there's a discussion that goes on about how do you want to repay this and probably why. Uh, because the person wants to make sure uh, that it's uh, a legitimate request and that you're not just stalling uh, for time. So in this case, uh, you said, look, it would be way better for me uh, in my money management to make two equal payments that are the same size, one four months from now, so you're actually going to pay that payment earlier, and another one eight months from the date of the original loan. So you, what you're saying now is I would like to make a payment here, and I would like to make that's at the four-month mark, and another equal size payment at the eight-month mark. So this is supposed to be eight months. Board's kind of shaky here, so we'll make the best of it we can. Now, because we said they're equal payments, and this is very key to some of the other questions in the book, we can use X for both of them. So let's say this will be X dollars and this will be X dollars. This means the two payments are going to be exactly the same size. So that's what we're looking at. That's the situation. If the um, lender agrees to this, and they probably would because you're actually making one payment, both payments actually earlier in the game, uh, this probably 
uh, would be easy to say, yeah, we can go along with that. Now, this thing below the line we'll call payment stream 2. Now, the general principle for solving a question like this is, both parties should be in agreement to this, as long as payment stream 1 is equivalent in every way to payment stream 2. So that, that's the overriding uh, theory here, that payment stream 1, now I have to be careful not to go off of our legible area here so that you can read this, payment stream 1 must equal payment stream 2. Now you also know from your previous studies in financial math that you can only compare money when it's at the same point in time. So we pick a focal date. In this case, we're going to pick arbitrarily uh, eight months from the original date of the loan. So we're going to pick this as our focal date. And what we're going to do to make sure that payment stream 1 equals payment stream 2, we're going to move all the money to the same point in time. So above the line, we're going to move this $3,000 ahead, so we'll call that S1. And notice it's going ahead two months. You look from the six-month mark to the eight-month mark. You could write this down. It's probably going to make this quite cluttered, but uh, you can go back and review this. Uh, so this is moving ahead two months. And this money here, the $4,600, is coming back four months. So I'll call that P2, a principal amount of money, because it's going back in time. And it's going back from the 12-month mark to the 8-month mark, so four months. So what we're saying payment stream 1 now will consist of is S1 and P2. So we have an S1 plus a P2. And that will have to equal everything below the line brought to that same point in time. So once you decide on the focal point, that's where all money will move. Both on the original agreement and on the one that's being renegotiated. So below the line, we're going to be moving this money also to the 8 month mark. Now notice that this X is already at the 8 month mark. So in this case, this is sort of the deal that your instructor probably has talked about. That today $5 is worth $5. And this will be the only day that really occurs. Tomorrow it will probably have less buying power. Yesterday it probably had more buying power. But because it's already right on that focal date, X dollars on that day is just X dollars. That's exactly how much that will be worth. So, one of the things over here is the X dollars. However, the other X dollars that you're going to pay at the four-month mark does have to move ahead to meet that same focal date. So we will call that S3, since we haven't used that number before. That's this X here at the four-month mark, moving ahead to the eight-month mark, so it's moving ahead four months. So the right-hand side is payment stream 2, that's X, that's already there, plus the S3. Now the last thing we have to, or the last thing at this point in time anyway, uh, the people have to agree on what interest rate they want to use in order to solve this question. Because we're moving money around, we're changing the original agreement, we have to decide on what interest rate we're going to be moving this money. Now these parties in this particular handout are going to agree to a modest amount and it's uh, 4%. Now remember, this is simple interest, so for all of this question, uh, we will just use a rate of 0 0.04 per annum. Alright, so now we're ready to really go ahead, uh, and this is laid out in your handout in, I think, fairly great, dip, uh, not difficulty, but detail. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of, uh, I'm going to be using the figures that are on that handout, uh, but you could take your time uh, and work through them individually also. So if we want to work this S1, we know the formula as S is P times 1 plus RT. So this would be the original amount of money, $3,000. So it would be 1 plus the rate we said is 4%, and the time we said was 2 months. So 2 twelfths. Positive exponent because money's moving ahead in time. 
Now the P2 is this $4,600. I'm probably going to run myself out of blackboard space or whiteboard space here, but we'll do our best. Uh, 1 plus 0 0.04 times 4 twelfths to the minus 1 because this money is going back in time. Now that will have to equal the original amount of money, the X. And the S3 is the other X that's coming ahead in time for months. So the amount of money is X dollars, 1 plus 0 0.04. It was going ahead 4 twelfths. I think I might have just made it to your screen there. And it's going ahead to a positive exponent. So that's what we have to deal with. Uh, and we go ahead and we do this work. Now again, I'm just going to read off of my handout. You could stop this now and practice with your calculator. Uh, but what I got when I did this was this one's $3,020. The next one is $4539.47. And below the line, the new agreement, we have the first X. Now when we do this work here, you have to realize this is called the accumulation factor. It's going to be make money grow in size. We're going to have more than one X. We have about 1.013 repeat X. Now on the left side, when we bring all of the money to the 8 month mark, and we add that all up, that's how much we would have owed if we would have just paid that whole original debt 8 months from the date at which we were given the money. And that works out to be 75.59.47. Now this next part is one of the areas that students tend to make mistakes. There are several areas here that traditionally students will make errors on. And this is why I'm making this video. I'm trying to avoid that for you. One of the most common ones we see as instructors when we mark this as a student will see an X here and an X here, and they just want to say equals 2X. That's called a critical error. And we have to take big marks off for that. So let's not have that happen. Here there's a 1X. One's always understood unless there's some other number there. So 1X and 1.013X is going to be 2.013X. So you can't ignore the 013. Now you have to realize if some money was coming back in time, this would be less than 1. So it might be 1x plus 0.9x, and that would be 1.9x. But whatever it is, add it up carefully. This is 2.013x. Now the next thing, of course, we do, using our calculator, we divide both sides by this thing that's called the numerical coefficient of x, the number that goes in front of the x. So we'll divide both sides by the 2.013. Now remember it's a 2.01 and the 3 is repeating so that you get an accurate answer. Always use your memory variables to get accurate answers. And this has knocked this down to just an X. And when we do this, uh, the division, we get 37.54.71. Now let's think back on what this question was asking us. It was saying if you had agreed to two amounts of money, $3,000 six months from the date of the loan, and $4,600 a year from the date of the loan, what would the two equal payments have to be if you want to move them one four months from the date of the loan and one eight months from the date of the loan? Well, we can see when we did all this and we moved the money around, we got $3,754.71. Well, your answer then is, since these are both X, that each payment will be exactly $3,754.71. Don't try and go back in again and move that figure with the formula, because that's the second critical error that students tend to make. So think about what you've done. It said, how much are the equal payments? So the answer here is that each payment would be, in other words, we have two payments, one four months from the date of the loan, one eight months from the date of the loan of $3,754.71. A word of caution. A lot of problems say, under the new agreement, there's to be two payments, one is twice as large as the other, 
or half the size of the other. Just be careful when you're doing the algebra part that you're setting that up correctly. For example, if this one was to be twice this one, we would have an x here and a 2x here. And when we went back to our equation, we would have the x and the 2x. So that would still be an x here, but there would be t this one would be twice as big. So about 2.027, something like that. And then you would add them together, uh, and you would get the 3.027, do your division, and you would get your answer for x. But now you would say, okay, the first payment's got to be this amount of money, and the second one would have to be twice that amount of money. So be careful on your original setup. Key always, think the problem through before you start. Have a vision of what this problem is about. That way, usually students will get these things right. Take your time. It involves a bit of algebra, and some of you, that's not your strongest point. But learn this, because it's like everything else in financial math. It doesn't go away. It's kind of like solving for M. A lot of students don't like to do that, and they think, well, if I just ignore it, maybe it'll go away. You know what's going to keep coming back time and time and time again. So take your time and learn this. I had one student recently that sort of prompted this video, as a matter of fact, and she said she would have got 100 on her final exam if it wasn't for this type of question. And then this brought her down to, I think it was an 87. Still a phenomenal mark. A lot of you are probably wishing you had that problem. Uh, but still a good mark, but you can see that all of these elements, they all fit together to form the complete puzzle. So you really want to take your time, learn this. Good luck with the rest of the course. I wish you all well.